you guys. Welcome once again to my Flickers of Fear movie review show. Now, just like last month uh, when we did Folk Horror February, I thought that for March we would also do a little bit of a theme. I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to be too rigid about it, but I thought since it was March, uh, we would do monster movies. So I thought it was a good time to visit this film because this is one that actually has been on my to watch list for a really long time. And actually, I think if I remember correctly, I thought I started watching it a couple years back and then for whatever reason, just never, I think maybe I only got like five or 10 minutes into it for never, whatever reason, just like never finished it probably because I had to go do something else or whatever and just like forgot about it. But since then, uh, because I'd become more familiar with the writer-director team who did this movie uh, and I had seen some of their other movies and really liked them a lot, I was kind of like, yeah, I should really get around to like watching this. And also very recently, um, I've had a couple recommendations from some of you guys as well uh, that this is a movie that you wanted to see me talk about. So this is the movie Spring from 2014. Now... I think this is one of those movies that it's best going into it knowing as little as possible. So if you haven't seen it and you would and you do want to watch it, then I would advise like not watching this. I'm not going to spoil the ending, but I will kind of spoil, you know, a few things that happen in it. They're probably better left like not known when you're first watching the movie. However, one thing I will say uh just to kind of winnow out people that you know, maybe wouldn't enjoy this movie is that please don't go into this thinking that it's a traditional straight up monster movie. There is a monster in it. Uh, it is a monster movie, but it is mostly a romance. Now, I know how I know what you're thinking. Like, I know some people would be like, why the fuck would I want to watch that? But honestly, this is one of the most audacious, I think, like, genre crossers that's been done in a long time. And, you know, it's been done before, like, the horror romance hybrid. Not a lot, but honestly, this is really kind of the best example of that that I can think of. And believe me, I'm really not into romance movies. I don't like chick flicks. I don't generally like love stories. I'm not, like, averse to them, but it's not really a genre I seek out very much. So again, it was it's very kind of ballsy to make what is essentially a love story, but with a monster component. Uh, I've seen this compared a lot to uh, the Richard Linklater, like before trilogy, like before Sunrise, before Sunset, those movies. Uh, and it does have, I'm, I'm, I think uh, on purpose, I think it does like homage those movies. It's so it's like a horror, like a body horror or a slightly Lovecraftian version of that. Uh, if that sounds like something you want to watch, because like I said, it is a horror movie, there is a monster, but it's mainly watching these two characters falling in love with one another and learning to accept uh, each other's quirks, which in this case are uh, quite severe. So, uh, so there's that. And honestly, I don't think that's too much of a spoiler, because if you see the most iconic poster for this, you can kind of see you can kind of get a hint of what's going on. And I think even the tagline for the movie says, love is a monster. So, you know, it, it's not that crazy. And I think if you've read, it came out in 2014, so it's been a few years. And I think a lot of people have talked about it in terms of it being a monster movie, but just don't approach it thinking that it's gonna be like a traditional monster movie. So this was written and directed by the team of Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead, who work together pretty much all the time. Uh, they also did Resolution, uh, which I think was their first kind of feature length film. This might have been their second one. Probably best known nowadays for The Endless, which I have seen, but I don't think I've reviewed it yet, even though I love that movie. It's brilliant. That's also kind of like a Lovecraftian uh, movie as well, a uh, cosmic horror type thing. And I probably will get around to reviewing that at some point because I love that movie. And they've also done a couple more recent ones that that I've either reviewed or that Tom and I reviewed, because I think we reviewed After Midnight. Uh, I think Tom and I both reviewed that. And uh, She Dies Tomorrow, I think I just reviewed that by myself, if I'm remembering correctly. So I have seen a lot of their uh, output. So if you liked, now if you liked The Endless, you would probably li really dig this if you haven't seen it, because this is the one that came out a movie or two before that one. So uh, they, I think they've also done a couple, they also did a couple episodes of Archive 81 and uh, some other things along that line. So, you know, they've, they've been quite busy. And like I said, this is a movie that gets talked about, maybe not as much as The Endless, because I feel like that's kind of the one that everybody talks about. 
Uh, but this is kind of like the second one, you know, behind that that everybody talks about. So the story behind this is that at the very beginning, we're following this young man uh, named Evan Russell. Now at the beginning, you know that this dude is like a good guy because he has uh, been spending apparently the last several months of his life, maybe longer, uh, caring for his mother who was dying of cancer. Um, you also find out that his father died quite suddenly, not too long ago, like of a heart attack. And since then, he's kind of been taking care of his mom and just like working as a cook in a restaurant uh, to kind of like support them, even though it's not really like what his big dream is. So very close to the beginning of the film, his mother passes away. And uh, shortly after this, because he's kind of left at sixes and sevens, um, he gets into, he's, you know, at the restaurant where he works, like drinking with his friend Tommy. And, you know, he gets kind of drunk. He gets into a fight, not really his fault, but he's sort of like provoked into it a little bit. And he ends up beating the shit out of the guy because, you know, they've just come from his mom's funeral and it's really like, he's not in a good place. So the guy who owns the restaurant is like, look, I really don't want to have to like fire you, but you know, the cops are coming around, that guy might press charges. And it's like, you know, maybe we can bring you back later on, you know, but we just can't have you around here right now. So he's lost his parents, he's lost his job, and he really doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. And he got a little bit of money, uh, like inheritance from his parents' death. So his friend says, why don't you just get the fuck out of here for a while? It's like, you know, the, the cops are going to be sniffing around. You might get in trouble if that guy presses charges for the fight. It's like, why don't you just take off, you know, somewhere and just get out of here and kind of find yourself. So he doesn't really know where to go. <laughs> he just has money and a passport. And he's like, oh, well, me and my dad always talked about maybe going to Italy one day. Uh, and we never got to go. So he's like, what? why not? I'll just go there. So he just randomly goes there. Now, interestingly, when he gets there at first, it's almost kind of like, and I think that, and I've seen a couple people that like reviewed the movie that were kind of like, well, you know, why didn't he just like, why didn't they just start the movie in Italy? Or why did we have to have this whole prologue at the beginning? But honestly, I liked that because as soon as he gets to Italy, it almost seems like he's gonna repeat the same shit. Like you can't run away from yourself, you know what I mean? You just find yourself when you get there type of thing. Because as soon as he gets there, he falls in with these two kind of really obnoxious, but also kind of lovable like British dudes. And uh, you know, they're very boorish. And uh, so, you know, and they kind of like mirror his kind of schlubby pothead friend. <laughs> like Tommy from back home where they're just kind of like wandering around and they don't really have any purpose in life. So he hangs out with them for a while and they end up going to this kind of like little seaside town. Um, you know, he, like I said, he's kind of like repeating the same stuff that was going on back then, but then like back when he was at home in California, but then he meets this mysterious young woman named Louise. Now, Louise, um, at first, approaches him so sort of forthrightly that he kind of thinks she's like a prostitute and that she's gonna just like, you know, roll him or something just because she's very forthright about, uh, you know, hey, don't you wanna like come back to my place right now? It's like the middle of the afternoon and he's like at a cafe with like the two British guys. And he's like, well, no, come on, let's. don't you want to go on a date or something like that? She said, yeah, I don't do that. So she's kind of one of these, uh, she likes sex but doesn't want to become emotionally involved kind of, uh, kind of girl. And he is, uh, you know, he's like, no, I'll, I'll pass on that. But it's like, I just, I want you to go out with me. I want us to have like a regular date. She's reluctant, but I mean, he really does seem to take a shine to her. And she seems to kind of take a shine to him as well. So as the movie goes on, um, he's kind of like, cause she's initially again, reluctant to get involved, but he likes her so much. He's into, so intrigued by her that he does, he doesn't like stalk her or anything. It's not, you know, it's, I know how it sounds. Cause I know they do that a lot in like romantic comedies, which is one of the reasons that I don't like them. Um, where the dudes just like keep pursuing the woman, like even after she's clearly said, Hey, piss off. I don't want to date you. But the way it's done here, it's not like that at all. It's not creepy in the least because she actually does seem interested in him and is receptive to him. She just, you know, she, she just has walls up. And uh, as it turns out, she has a very good reason for that, as you discover as the movie goes on. So for a long time throughout the movie, it's basically following them around this gorgeous, gorgeous um, Italian seaside village 
uh, you know, and them just kind of like going through the process of essentially like falling in love with one another. Now, uh, at this, like Evan's two British friends who he'd been staying at a hostel with, they decide, you know, they're kind of sick of Italy and they piss off to Amsterdam, but they think it's too expensive. So they piss off to Amsterdam. Uh, they ask if Evan wants to go, but by this time he's kind of become smitten with Louise. So he's like, no, I think I'm going to stay here. But then he's kind of running out of money. So he finds this situation where there's this old guy named Angelo and he's uh, willing to trade him like kind of a crappy looking like room for some work on his olive farm. So basically he does that just so he can stay in town and kind of woo Louise. Now, as I said, you know pretty much that there has to be something the matter with Louise. Um, and for a long time, they don't tell you exactly what it is. It's interesting because I was, I saw like uh, one review of this, I think it was like a YouTube review. And one of the uh, comments said, I kind of wish that they hadn't like told you or, th or that it wasn't um, telegraphed that Louise was a monster because for a long time, um, you weren't really sure if there was going to be some kind of like torture porn situation because you knew that there was something weird about her when she approached him so forthrightly. Uh, the way she did. So, you know what I mean? So it, it was almost kind of like, uh, what's that? What was that movie with uh, Natasha Henstridge Species where she was just trying to like reproduce herself? It's, you know, it's, well, you know what I mean? But I did see some people that didn't, that weren't aware that it was a monster movie and said, oh, I kind of thought it was going to go like in a hostile, like torture porn kind of direction, which it doesn't. Like I said, it's absolutely a, a, a monster movie. So, but for a long time, they don't tell you what exactly her deal is. You know what I mean? And I will say, I don't want to spoil what kind of monster she is exactly because I'm actually, I don't even know if I could spoil it because I'm not entirely sure. I kind of like that the way that what she is, is explained sort of leaves a lot of things open. It's, it's not supernatural really. She's not like a vampire or nothing like that, but it leaves it. It's, it's organic enough that you could almost kind of buy it, like in a scientific sort of man. I mean, not really because it's a monster movie. And if you see some of the transformations that she goes through, you're like, yeah, okay, that could happen in real life. But it's not as supernatural, like I said, as like a vampire or a werewolf or something like that. But for a long time, you don't really know because he and, and Evan doesn't know either because he's like falling in love with her. They're kind of going on dates. She finally relents. They start like talking to each other and she's, you know, very guarded, but uh, they eventually start opening up to one another. And but at inopportune times, something will happen like like the side of her face will start like cracking and shit like that. And she's like, oh, shit. And then she takes out like these um syringes and then she has to give herself injections to make herself look like a human again uh she also does shit like uh eats a cat so they don't show it but they do kind of show you know they hint that that's what she's gonna do and then they kind of show a little bit of the aftermath uh, and she eats a rabbit so she does like start eating animals but you know, as upsetting as that is, because, you know, guys know how I feel about, like, <laughs> you seeing, like, fucked up stuff happening to animals at movies. But at the same time, she's such a likable character that you feel sorry for her. Because even though for a long time you don't know what kind of monster she is, she doesn't seem to be able to help it. And uh, she seems kind of, like, desperate to, oh, shit, you know, I have to get this back into, like, con under control. Because you can tell that at some stages, like, she can't control what it is that she does because there's this one scene where she's uh, on a date with Evan and she kind of starts to monster out and I guess she doesn't have her syringe, so she's just like, oh, gotta go, by," you know what I mean? And, like, she kind of runs off. And then she ends up in this alley uh, before, you know, she doesn't have time to get home and, like, this, you know, jackass, like, American tourist comes up to her thinking she's a hooker and, you know, tries to essentially rape her. And uh, she just like turns around and like fucking eats. I think she bites his dick off actually. But uh, but yeah, so there was that. So she can't really control like what it is that she does. But I will say that a lot of the um, effects work that they did in this were practical. There is some CGI, but the effects work in this, like when like her various monster forms look really cool. And like I said, the mythology behind the monster that she is 
is really unique. I don't, they don't even, she doesn't even like have a name for it. There's not even a name for it, but it does have Lovecraftian uh, and also like ancient Greek Roman mythology type vibe to it, which I thought was kind of cool because you don't really see a lot of movies like, because I don't know, I kind of feel like when they're going to do a monster movie, they usually have like a defined monster. Whereas this one was kind of more like, not, she's not a shapeshifter. It's not that. It's just there. But like I said, there was kind of like an embryonic or an evolutionary genetic sort of component to it, which I thought was kind of cool. But yeah, but so it, you'll know if you've seen like some of the, um, some of the effects work they do on this. It's very like, it's almost like Cronenbergian or even like, like John Carpenter a little bit, you know what I mean? Like kind of the body horror type stuff they have going on, but it's really, really well done. But everything about this movie, I mean, honestly, it seems like most of the reviews I saw this, because I read a lot of different reviews of it, like, uh, over the last few days after, since I've saw, seen it, and almost all of them overwhelmingly positive. And this, a lot of it, too, from, you know, straight up horror channels and a lot of the, you know, horror channels, like, being run by dudes. And normally, dudes in general would not, uh, you know, heterosexual dudes in general would not watch... A romance film. Hell, I would not watch a romance film. Not usually. It's not usually a genre that I pick. I'm not completely averse to them, but it's not usually something that I would choose to watch. You know what I mean? By and large, I find them kind of annoying. But, uh, so if you said, oh, it's like a romance, but she's a monster. But it, the thing about it is that the romance has to work, and in this one, it absolutely works. The thing that's great about, uh, about this movie is that the acting performances, uh, Lou Taylor Pucci, who was in uh, Thumbsucker, among other things, and Nadia Hilker, uh, she was in, I, well, she's been a lot of stuff, but I recognize her from The Walking Dead, actually, like the last few seasons. But the two of them, they have really good chemistry with one another, and the way that their relationship unfolds is so organic and so naturalistic. They seem so natural with each other, and the conversations that they have sound like actual conversations, so it doesn't seem like a cheesy, sappy rom-com or like a cheesy, sappy chick flick type thing where it's just these kind of like grand declarations of blah, blah, blah. It sounds like two young people who are falling in love, like conversations they would actually have with one another. And they both seem like very interesting characters. So even though it takes a while for the whole monster thing to really come to into full flower, as it were, I was just riveted by these two characters. You know what I mean? Even though I, I suspected that she was a monster, obviously. But I, I liked them so much as characters that I was like, I kind of want to, I want to see where this is going. Like, what's going to happen? You know what I mean? Is she going to monster out and pull his head off? Is she going to, you know, you, did, you don't know what's going to happen. And so, and I think that was really kind of like a testament to the acting in this, that even without the monster element, just watching the two of them interacting with one another and, you know, developing this relationship was interesting enough for me to be really invested in their characters. And then just like when all the, you know, gross tentacly monster stuff came into it, I was just kind of like, oh, okay, that's even better. That's like, you know, that's like, that's like a whole nother like dimension to the thing. And I, you know, easy, the thing about it is that, I mean, the theme of this movie, obviously being, you know, true love being, uh, accepting somebody for who they are, even if they are a monster, which sounds crazy, but it totally, totally works in this in a way that's really hard to describe if you haven't seen it. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I really, really liked this movie a lot. It's probably one that I will, uh, watch again, I'm sure. Um, I just, I don't know. I, there was something about it that I really loved. Like, the cinematography, like I said, beautiful. Um, you know, this, this gorgeous sweeping shots of, like, the Italian seaside and, just beautiful, beautiful shots. And there was just, the character work was just so good in it that, like I said, even without the monster stuff, I was still like really invested in their relationship, even though, like I said, romance isn't really a genre that I watch all that much that I'm not really that big a fan of. But I mean, this was absolutely uh, one of the best possible. And to be honest, I can't really think offhand of another um, kind of horror romance that worked quite as well as this. I mean, I guess you could say something like, okay, well, like an American werewolf in London, that was kind of like, I mean, that was mostly a horror movie, but that had a romance kind of thing in it too. And I think this was kind of more along those lines. Like I said, mostly, and pretty much every review says this, mostly this is 
essentially like a Richard Linklater, you know, before sunrise, before sunset, that his before trilogy. This is like that, like two characters falling in love in like a beautiful uh, location. It's like that, but one of them is a monster. You know what I mean? So it's like a horror version of that, uh, but still mostly a romance. Uh, so if that kind of sounds like something you would like and like i said if you're a if you're a horror guy and you're like well i don't really like romance i mean give it a shot anyway because i don't like romance either and i really really dug this because just i really liked the way the genres were blended i think i thought they did a really good job and like i said i think it's not just because of the monster shit which was great but also because just the two characters were so likable and you got so invested in their relationship uh, that you wanted to see what was going to happen to them, especially once the monster stuff got revealed. So if you've seen Spring from 2014 or uh, any of Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead's other movies, uh, then let me know in the comments. I definitely will be reviewing The Endless at some point because I know we've done a couple of their other movies, but we haven't done The Endless for whatever reason. I don't know why, uh, because I really did like that movie. So I'll get around to doing that one as well. But yeah, um, if you've seen this, let me know what you think about it in the comments. Uh, I think it's pretty easy. It's streaming in a bunch of different places. Um, it's on Tubi. It's on, I think it used to be on Shudder, but I don't think it's on there anymore. Or no, mate. Yeah. Yeah, it is on Shudder. So it's on Shutter. It's on uh, Tubi for free. I think it's on Amazon Prime. And uh, so it's a bunch of places. Very, very easy to see. So uh, if you haven't seen it, then watch it and let me know what you thought. If you have seen it, uh, then let me know what you thought about it in the comments. And uh, that will do it for this Flickers of Fear, the first in our Monster March uh, little theme that we're doing. Uh, so I will see you guys again on the next one. Bye.